Hello everyone. Just want to touch base and let you see what we've been working on as far as the coil calculator. All of the information contained within this video can be found at the following forum. And of course I've made reference to that many times on my videos and that's the teepforumco.com. Now what makes a good coil? Well we need to know what type of windings we're going to use. And we're going to use magnetic wire. It's got an epoxy coating on it. There are many different types of coil windings that can be used. Some are copper, some are aluminum, there's a couple of others as well. Um, we're going to use uh, copper for our coils, which is the standard magnetic type of wire, and that's what we use in all of our calculations. Now we need to know what type of material we're going to make our bobbins out of, or our spools. And the common materials out of those are plastic, cardboard, even wood. Some of them are even glass. Um, I've seen a few glass ones, have not tested them, but maybe an interesting thing to test. But for all of our calculations, we're going to use the standard, which is plastic. Also, our cores. In all of our calculations, we use an air core. And the basis for that is because the materials that people use for their cores are wide and varying and that's very difficult to calculate in on a mass scale. In a future calculator we will incorporate that in so that you can input what type of core you actually have as long as you know the density, the ohms, and resistance of your core you'll be able to calculate that in. Now looking at the end profile of a coil is very important. And the reason why that is is you can actually see where your core sits on the inside of your coil and you can see all the individual little coils that come off of that. And that's how a coil is made up when you spin it together, of course. And the reason why we need to know that is we need to know the total circumference of our coil. We need to know our diameter. We need to know the radius. And we're going to take all of that information and we're going to use a formulation, pi r squared. This is a good representation of how pi r squared works. If you've ever been kind of how does pi r squared work, this is a good representation or visual aid to show how pi r squared works. Where do we start? Well, the formulas for our coil are going to start from the coil itself. I've simplified this to show you how all the formulations are going to work, taking just one section of coil off of our coil, showing each individual wrapping and from our center of our core. In this formulation we're going to know that our center to the first start of one of our coils is 0.25 because we're using a half inch core. Our total overall size of our core uh, of our coil is 1.22. Now taking that we know that from our radius here we're going to add the thickness of our wire that's going to give us our next dimension. So our pi for our first dimension, which is our core, is 0.785. We're going to add our dimension of our wire. We're going to add that together with our core, and that's going to give us on, a, on our pi of 0.8523. That's going to calculate out all the way down. Now, why do we need those measurements? Well, we need those measurements, and then we're going to times those by two so we can figure out how long each individual wire for our coil is in this section. Therefore, we can maintain and regulate how many feet we're using in our coil. So we'll get an accurate measurement. In our model here we're using a core that is 0.5 inches or a half inch. Our length of our spool, which would be from this coil all the way down, would be 2.25 inches, so an inch and a, uh, two and a half, two and a quarter inches long. Now we know our spool dimension is an inch and almost a quarter wide. We know that it's two and a quarter inches long. And we know our wire size that we're using in this demonstration is 0 0.0213. If we take that 0 0.0213 and divide that by 2.25, which is our length, we know that we will have 105.63. If we round that up to 106 and we times that by our pi r squared, which is our radius of our wires, pi r squared, we know that that's 29.26 inches per single wrapping, and we're going to times that by how many wrappings that we have, which is 106, equals 3,101.56 in inches. 
If we take that dimension, divide it by 12, because there's 12 inches per foot, that equals 258.46 feet. Now, figuring all this out longhand, you can do that. But we decided that we would want a calculator to figure all this out and be able to manipulate several factors of a coil before we actually build it. Now, what we need for that calculation is very simple. This is an illustration to show what we need and what lines you're going to fill out on our form so that you can calculate out for the best possible coil. You're going to need to know the core dimension, which is line 5. You're going to need your total overall length, which is line 10. And you're going to need to know your diameter, which is line 7. The reason why this is important is how you actually lay out your coils and your wrappings inside of your coil for the best possible pulse and drive relationship between the magnetic flux and fields. If you'll notice on the top illustration, you'll notice that our trigger wire is the blue wire, which is very small, and our run wires are very large, but we've got some problems here. The trigger wire is not large enough to trigger our run wires, therefore our coil is going to oscillate. Not a, bad, not, a, not a good situation. The best solution is to maximize our space on our coil, to maximize the use of the magnetic fields, and to make sure that all of our coils are touching each other to give better reflux in our magnetic field and to reduce the lens effect. Now, you'll notice that our trigger wire is much larger in this one, so that's going to be a direct relationship and calculation of our drive wire to give us the proper size trigger wire to use for our coil to maximize the space, magnetic field, and inductance of our coil. Now, what we need to know to calculate our coil. We need to know several factors. We need to know the coil overall size. We need to know the core size. We need to know the wire size that we'll be using. We need to know the power input. What are you applying to the coil to induce its pulse? Is it 12 volts, 24 volts, 9 volts? Well, how many volts are you putting into it? We need to know the total year turns that you're going to use. The common is 100 turns per volt. That generally works out well. How many feet of wire we need? So how many feet of wire in our total coil? If we're building 12 coils, how many feet of wire do we need to make those 12 coils if all of our coils are the same? Or if all of our coils are different, how many feet of wire total do we need? Our Gauss reading, or our Gauss reading, of the coil. That's important because if you have a 5,000 Gauss magnet and you're pulsing that magnet with 100 Gauss, your motor is not going to spin correctly or may not spin at all. So if you use a 5,000 Gauss magnet and a 5,000 Gauss coil, you're going to induce maximum rotation. After the rotation starts, you can reduce your Gauss rating through your circuitry to keep your rotations, but have a lower field of resonance in your coil and use less power to maintain the RPMs. We need to know the amps draw. How much is the amps of that coil if you just let it draw power? How many amps are you going to actually give it to input your power? And the max draw of the total coil meaning volts and amps. And your finished ohms of the coil is very important. If you know the total finished ohms of your coil and you test it and it's not ohming out to be correct, you could have a short in your coil and you may need to rewrap your coil. You also know that if you don't use the amount of feet that it should use, that there is a problem with your windings, which could cause lens effect and reduce the function of your motor. And lastly, you need to know the weight of your finished coil so that you know what parameters you need to set for the materials that you're going to use to make sure that they're strong enough to withstand the weight and pressures and forces of your motor at spinning speeds. Now we have all the criteria, so let's put this into the formula, into the calculator, and let's see how all these come together. I'll do that in the next video, and that'll be part two. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.